Esta noche, disculpas por las demoras, han surgido una serie de inconvenientes externos. Y bueno, en primera instancia, este, queríamos eh, mencionar un poco el motivo de la presencia del doctor eh, con nosotros. Eh, así como nos hemos comprometido desde hace varios años, desde que estamos en el club, a preocuparnos y ocuparnos de la salud de nuestros entonces eh, hemos estado trabajando con el doctor desde hace alrededor de un año y medio o un poco más sobre una de las enfermedades que nos trajo bastante preocupación en la variedad miniatura a raíz de esa enfermedad nos hemos puesto en contacto con el doctor eh, y bueno, eh, hemos logrado un gran avance en ese sentido la enfermedad la conocemos todos ahora es la llamada MAC y hemos logrado un inmenso avance entre nuestros SNAPSER eh, con respecto a la salud ocupados de esa enfermedad en particular pero como sabemos que no es la única que compromete a nuestra raza en sus tres variedades el doctor nos va a brindar una conferencia de dos días donde va a hablar de enfermedades eh, genéticas eh, en general. Va a nombrar otras enfermedades con las que queremos también empezar a trabajar y empezar a mejorar de ese modo la salud de nuestros hermanos. Eh, sabemos que están presentes criadores de otras razas a las cuales les agradecemos enormemente la presencia y le agradecemos también la presencia de colegas veterinarios, genetistas de nuestro país que quieren escuchar al doctor en esta charla. Y bueno, en primera instancia la presentación a pedido del doctor va a ser cortita. Eh, su currículum que es muy extenso y que pretendíamos aparezca en la pantalla no lo hemos podido lograr el doctor nos pidió que no lo mencionemos ampliamente porque para él eso no es importante sí quiere que mencionemos que es nacido en la ciudad de Zurich de Suiza ahí se recibió de veterinario eh, empezó su camino en la salud eh, ocupado en primera instancia en las displasias de cadera posteriormente eh, se especializó en las enfermedades genéticas es hematólogo y eh, actualmente eh, reside en, en la ciudad de Pensilvania es profesor en la Universidad de Pensilvania y desde allí trabaja en su laboratorio llamado PENGEN que es de reconocimiento mundial así que bueno, estamos más que orgullosos sumamente contento de poder presentarles en esta noche y en la de mañana al doctor Us Giger que nos va a tratar de nutrir con inmensa cantidad de información que ojalá podamos todos disfrutar esta noche por una cuestión de orden eh, las preguntas que van a surgir seguramente van a ser muchas les pedimos si podemos hacerlas al final para que él pueda explayarse con toda su, su charla preparada ¿sí? y una cosa que queremos aclararles eh, también eh, una eh, digamos, generosidad del doctor va a haber un sorteo en el día de hoy y en el día de mañana son dos de eh, un estudio de más gratuito para las personas que están presentes y que van a concursar simplemente con la lista eh, cuando se han anotado eh, en la entrada. En el día de mañana eh, se va a sortear también un libro de neonatología eh, veterinaria que fue donado por la empresa Proca. Así que bueno, nada más que escucharlo, les deseo mucha suerte, <risa> que puedan aprovechar todo, piensen todas las preguntas que puedan hacer y los dejo en la presencia del doctor.
So uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much. I was not clapping for myself. I thought it was Dr. Uh, Graciela who gave a nice introduction. I'm sure she uh, presented everything in a most uh, perfect way. Also, I'm sorry, I do not speak Spanish and therefore could not understand it. I did not know Dr. Graciela before, but I had the pleasure to have actually a barbecue with her and many other friends who are here uh, on Saturday evening, which was very pleasant to get to know some of them. And uh, yesterday I had uh, uh, Mr. Martin as well as his sister Natalia take me to Tickers and it was a beautiful day for seeing it, also a little cold and wet. And today I spent actually with Dr. Uh, Richard Knapp, who is a colleague from me from Guasaba, uh, touring a little bit in the city. When we went for the barbecue, I was told it's going to be uh, 20 minutes, and it was 45 minutes, right? When we went to uh, see some part of um, the city, it was not a short bus ride, but a very long bus ride, and walking would have been faster. And the longest was actually tonight that I was waiting from 20 past 5 until, you know, 20, maybe 7 p.m. tonight to get here. But I did actually come from Philadelphia, which was a little further away. El sábado, cuando fue a sábado, él esperaba hacer un viaje en auto de 20 minutos, pero realmente llegó 45, eh, paseando por la ciudad. Dice que el, el trayecto más largo que hizo hasta ahora es el de hoy, que está desde las 5 y media esperando que lo fueran a buscar, pero lo que sí, el viaje más largo que ha hecho hasta ahora ha sido de primera vez que ha sido So I'm learning about Argentina time, which is beautiful. And I did actually have an opportunity to come here once before in the early 2000s for the World Small Animal Veterinary Conference and the university, which was so great that I really wanted to come back and I really appreciate the Miniature Schnauzer Club in Buenos Aires to invite me here uh, to work with you and show some of the work that we actually did together. Él estuvo ya en Buenos Aires en el año 2000 en el Congreso Internacional de Medicina Veterinaria en Pequeños Animales y agradece al Club de Nacional por haberlo traído a la Argentina por permitir trabajar con ellos en conjunto con la raza y poder hoy mostrar los avances que se hicieron en la genética en las diferentes enfermedades. While I speak about the health and specifically avian tuberculosis in the miniature schnauzer, I'm going to address other diseases in miniature schnauzers, but also many of these issues are also important for, oops, uh, they're also important for other breeds. So I understand some of you are breeding giant schnauzers that have other breeds uh, here as well. Uh, many of the principles that I present to you are very similar. I Okay. Entonces, eh, él va a abordar el tema de la tuberculosis aviar, que es el MAP. Aparte de eso, va a hablar sobre otras enfermedades que afectan a las otras variedades de los schnauzer, así como otras razas, y todo como se trabaja en estas enfermedades, todo se basa sobre los mismos principios. 
So I'm actually in the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, but originally Swiss. And our hospital that you see up here is seeing about 35,000 patients per year and is in the center of the city. Que vive en Filadelfia y trabaja en la Universidad de Pensilvania y el hospital que se muestra en la foto atiende 35 mil pacientes por año. Uh, except for the high-rise buildings that we have in Philadelphia, I think the city is as big, Philadelphia, as Buenos Aires. Uh, except that we have high-rise buildings in Philadelphia, not so much here in Buenos Aires, I think the cities are very similar in size, very big cities. And when you're emailing me, uh, and I'm in the United States, I'm actually there where the arrow is. Um, my office is there, my laboratories are there, but the whole building is for the clinics when I see patients. I need to mention that I do have a laboratory which is called Tension. I do get support from the American Kennel Club, uh, Canine Health Foundations, as well as the National Institutes of Health for One Health issues. And I also work with some companies that have potentially some essays or tools that I can use for my research. <laughs> de la Sociedad de Salud Animal de América y también de algunos laboratorios privados que han desarrollado algunos trabajos respecto de los temas que él está desarrollando. So what I was thinking about is to give you a kind of ideas about the dog, uh, the breed, miniature schnauzers overall. And I'm using that because I obviously work here with people who have miniature schnauzers or are very familiar with that breed. And uh, I do not mean to say the miniature schnauzer has a lot of genetic diseases. Many breeds or all the breeds have some genetic traits just like humans. So overall, there are probably about 900 hereditary diseases in the dog, and that is much, much more than in 1950 when it was maybe 50 diseases or less. And uh, I see some of the misspellings here are actually caused by the computer system that is not completely compatible. So some words got together here, and I apologize for that. So I have listed here a variety of diseases for which some of them I will give you some uh, insight as we have seen them in clinics but also done some research about these diseases. They may include progressive retinal atrophy, uh, oxalate urinary calculi, myotonia congenita, mucopolysaccharidosis type 6, stomatocytosis, hyperlipidemia, pancreatitis, as well as hepatic AV fistula, and of course, course uh, MAC. Tenemos entonces eh, atrofia progresiva de la retina, sí, hicimos eh, sí, empezando la cirugía, eh, cálculos de oxalato en orina, miotonía congénita, estomatocitosis, hiperlipidemia, pancreatitis, hepatitis y fístulas. 
So when we are starting off this retinal atrophy, which is one of the issues that I know is bothering your breed quite a bit, I have to say I'm not an ophthalmologist. But dogs in your breed will often develop some blindness as they are aging in the older age, and recent research has identified a different type of mutation in the gene that is responsible for it, which is caused PRA, which is called PRAB. Los perros desarrollan cataratas a medida que van envejeciendo, pero se pudo detectar una mutación en el gen PRA. So the dog that is healthy has the eye on the left hand side, whereas the dog that has a severe progressive, atrop uh, progressive retinal atrophy has the eye on the right hand side. These are the dramatic features, but some of them have milder features. <laughs> You need to realize for that particular disease, these animals actually may not get blind, and some do, so it is a genetic predisposition, but not everyone seems to get affected. Los perros que presentan esta patología no necesariamente van a quedar ciegos, sino que lo que implica esta enfermedad es una predisposición genética a tenerla, pero no necesariamente todos aquellos que tengan la afectación van a presentar ceguera. It is autosomal recessive, so they need to have the gene from the mother and the father, and beside that PRAB, they can also have another form of PRA, such as PRA-A, as well as possibly a third type, based on the ophthalmology information at the current time. So I think it is important to continue to do eye exams and not just genetic testing because the eye exams will tell you when an animal is going to have its retinal disease or not. Another disease that is quite interesting is patella luxation that can happen in the breed as well, where the patella, the kneecap, is moving inside as a puppy and causes some of the gait abnormalities, as seen in many small breed dogs. And just like in hip dysplasia, patella luxation seems to be a polygenic trait, and I will talk a little bit more about these polygenic traits tomorrow, but not get into details, but there is more than one gene involved, and maybe also some environmental factors. La luxación patelar es una enfermedad poligenética, quiere decir que se encuentran varios genes codificando para, para la presentación de esta enfermedad, igual que en la displasia de cadera, y mañana va a estar hablando sobre esto. Another example of uh, something that you might easily see in your breed are some of the umbilical hernias, which happens to be in many different breeds, and uh, these are also genetic and should be considered an issue as they can be passed on from one to the other generation. 
Otra patología que van a observar comúnmente en su raza son las hernias umbilicales, que también tienen un factor genético, tanto en el esnoso miniatura como en otras razas, y deberían tomarse en consideración. And then finally, there is another deformity that one can look at, and these are the, red, uh, the retained testicles. And this is a complicated issue that is seen in many different breeds, and some of them are very serious ones, where the testicles are internal, whereas some of the other ones are more on the milder side. <laughs> So some of them actually have one testicle in the scrotum, like you see here, and the other one is internal. Some have them in the inguinal canal, and others have them all the way in the body. And when they're really deep in the body, they can actually also become more likely tumorous, and that can cause severe bone marrow disease. Algunos animales pueden presentar un testículo en el escroto descendido, otro en el canal inguinal, o pueden también presentar los testículos eh, internamente en cavidad abdominal, y estos testículos pueden desarrollar en tumores. If the testicles are not down within two months or less, it is likely a delayed process and therefore an indication that this may become in the next generations a more serious problem of a retained testicle. Si a los dos meses de edad el testículo no se encuentra descendido, esto nos da un indicio de que tenemos una enfermedad eh, genética que esta se puede eh, presentar en las siguientes generaciones. Another thing that you're probably going to be aware of in the breed as well is canine hypothyroidism, which is actually a hereditary autoimmune thyroiditis. And overall, this is seen in many, many, many different breeds and seems to be more commonly seen today than actually in the past. So, for instance, studies have shown that there might be 7% in purebred dogs and 10% even in mixed breed dogs with canine hypothyroidism. El hipotiroidismo se presenta con mayor prevalencia actualmente y se observa en todas las razas. Eh, un estudio demostró que se, se está presentando en un 7% en animales de raza y hasta en un 10% en animales que vienen de raza mestiza. On a clinical side, you will see these dogs are often very lethargic, they're not very active, they are heat seeking, they are overweight frequently, and veterinarians can do very specific diagnostic tests to make a specific diagnosis. Los animales que presentan hipotiroidismo se van a mostrar letárgicos con una tendencia a la, a la obesidad. Y el veterinario puede realizar pruebas químicas para hacer un diagnóstico de la enfermedad. And if such dogs are identified with this problem, then one would have to supplement them with thyroid hormone for life. And that needs to be adjusted as time goes on because some might need more or less. Los animales que son diagnosticados con hipotiroidismo tienen que ser suplementados con hormonas tiroideas. Y eso debe ser controlado periódicamente, dado que pueden estar más o menos medicación conforme avanzan en su vida. If they are not managed properly, these animals have then a predisposition to other diseases, such as infectious diseases, and therefore it's good to actually treat them early on. Los hipotiroides que no son tratados correctamente presentan predisposición para otras enfermedades como infecciones. Another big situation, which I think uh, is particularly uh, also seen in uh, miniature schnauzers, but also in other breeds, is the portosystemic hepatic or liver shunts. Another problem that we observe in the race, in the schnauzer miniature, like in other races, is the portosystemic. This is a very big problem in dogs, but not seen, uh, and in cats, but not seen in people. Babies never have that. So it's a unique disease. In people, hepatic shunts are usually called by alcoholism. 
by drinking too much alcohol in older age person. El shoes empático se presenta en el ser humano en gente grande que ha consumido mucho alcohol. Now, in the dog, we recognize the larger breeds, like the giant schnauzers, they actually have the, uh, the, uh, the intrahepatic shunt, whereas the smaller breeds have the extrahepatic shunt, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And any breed can also have this hepatic microvascular dysplasia, which I'm telling for the veterinarians here in the audience, because that is more difficult to recognize because one does not see by ultrasound the big vessels. Hay otra enfermedad que afecta, que es la displasia vascular hepática, que es más difícil de diagnosticar porque no se ve en la dilatación de los otros sacrificios. In addition, particularly the miniature schnauzer actually has a very specific type of shunt, which is called AV fistula, from a, uh, arterial to venous shunting. This is a big issue because these animals have actually a high pressure system because it comes from the artery, the blood, and thereby causes problems such as severe ascites. So they have a big abdomen with fluid in, in there. So these animals with hepatic shunt might present uh, beside the ascites, which is more specific to the AV fistula, they usually present with sort of like neurological behavioral changes as well as stunted growth. These animals behave strangely in that that they are often lethargic, particularly after taking in food. And I would say particularly if they will participate in one of your wonderful Argentine barbecues. In fact, it is the meat, the protein, that really causes the problems in these hepatic shunts, that they're going to get neurological from the toxins, that these animals will wander around, look like blind, do some head pressing, and really bump their head, as you can see in this particular puppy here. If they are left alone or if they get treatment and are not fed, then they usually get better within a 12 to 40, uh, 24 hour period. But they obviously cannot function properly and thereby they do need surgical intervention to correct that to have a proper life. So what you see is actually on radiographs that the liver is extremely small on the radiograph, but the best way of diagnosing is by ultrasonography where one can really show the shunt by uh, looking at these vessels which are in black here. So 
So we do need to get a proper diagnosis with some blood tests, but also with ultrasonography to really document that this animal has a shunt, and then it can potentially be with a special surgeon to get repaired and get well. Estos animales se pueden diagnosticar a través de los análisis de sangre, pero más importante es hacer las ultrasonografías y ecografías para conseguir un diagnóstico acertado y poder hacerlos un cirujano para que reparen el defecto. In fact, one can uh, today not only do that by surgery, but actually putting in some little rings to close the vessel that is shunting from the venous to the uh, arterial side. Despite a lot of research by lots of different groups on this disease, we still do not know exactly the mechanism, but we know it's common in certain breeds, and therefore it has a genetic basis, but we do not know yet what the cause is. A pesar de que se ha investigado por varios grupos, sabemos que tiene una base genética, pero todavía no se ha podido identificar exactamente de dónde proviene la enfermedad. This definitely is something where you need to get to a specialist if you want to fix that because a primary veterinarian generally is not able to go and fix something like that. And when they are neurological, they need medical attention such as emergency care with various uh, medications and diet, etc. Another thing that I thought uh, is of curiosity more so than actually a big issue for uh, your breed is that these animals have a slight anemia sometimes, and the anemia is characterized by some really abnormal looking blood cells. En los estados de miniatura a veces se presenta un tipo de anemia, es una anemia leve, que, se, que cuando se estudia se ve luego los rojos anormales. When we in the laboratory look at blood smears, we see on the left hand side, and I apologize for the picture, it's the screen and the projection that is not good, it's very nice here on my computer, but red blood cells on a blood smear, when you're going to stain it, you see a nice red ring around it. So these are the red blood cells and these are the white blood cells called neutrophils like this one. Whereas in the miniature schnauzer as well as in the standard schnauzer, we have recognized the cells to be far bigger than here, and instead of having a round central paler like this one, they have this kind of streak white area, which is known as a stoma and mouth. Despite the fact that these blood cells look very, very abnormal and are very big uh, and cause somewhat of an anemia, it is really not a serious problem. The dogs can live actually very nicely with this issue for many normal years. So it's more important that you as owners and breeders of the breed or being a veterinarian know about this because otherwise, as I just heard from another breed, the Portuguese water dogs had something like that, where they are very concerned about that illness, when in fact it might only be a small abnormality that you can live with very nicely. 
Esta enfermedad se presenta también en el perro de agua portugués y lo que hay que tener en cuenta es que si bien es una normalidad, es una enfermedad con la cual el animal puede convivir perfectamente. So not every genetic defect, as I would call it, is really a serious problem. One has to differentiate between the mild things that might be slight abnormalities to the severe ones. Entonces hay que diferenciar entre las enfermedades genéticas severas y aquellas que no lo son tanto y ver la importancia que ellas tienen. I will consider that very similar to what your dog show looks like with the judges. There are some minor kind of imperfections uh, and there are some major ones which might really lead to disqualifications. Except for me as a veterinarian and an animal welfare person, I'm obviously much more worried about the health and the looks of the dog. Excepto yo, como veterinario y en algo del bienestar animal, me preocupa más la salud que el aspecto físico de los animales. So we always want to put the health in front of everything else because that's what's important for our pets and breeding dogs. Entonces debemos siempre poner la salud por delante de la estética porque es realmente lo que cuenta en nuestra mano. Another problem that may be seen mostly by the veterinarian or when complications occur is the hyperlipidemia in miniature schnauzers, which means that the blood has very high lipid content instead of a normal uh, blood sample. Otra enfermedad que se puede observar en todos los veterinarios es la hiperlipidemia. Esto significa un aumento de la cantidad de grasa o líquidos presentes en la sangre de los animales. So if the blood sample looks like this, or the whole blood looks like a milkshake, a strawberry milkshake, that is abnormal, and it is not just because you had a wonderful barbecue or some other wonderful uh, dish uh, in Argentina. Entonces, si una muestra de sangre se ve como la que vemos en el tubo, que parece un milkshake de frutilla, Eso es una patología y no tiene nada que ver con haber comido un riquísimo asado de la familia. We know this is genetic in the breed. It does happen also in a cat breed, the Himalayan, and it also can happen in other dog breeds. And we do not know at the moment what the precise defect is to have this cause, but my previous student, Eva Furrow, is actually studying that at the University of Minnesota and if you have a case you might talk with her. Eva, Eva Sutton, está investigando esta enfermedad en la Universidad de Minnesota y en caso de que tengan algún perro que presente la hiperlipidemia, se pueden comunicar con ella. She actually also studies oxalate calculi in the breed, and so I'll mention her name once more. Ella también estudia los cálculos de oxalato de calcio en la raza. The reason why I'm presenting this hyperlipidemia is because your dogs with that type of high lipid in the blood are predisposed to a serious complication called uh, acute pancreatitis. So acute pancreatitis really frequently presents with uh, inappetence, Vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, shock, and it can actually cause the death of the animal and it's often quite acute. La pancreatitis aguda se presenta con síntomas como letargia, vómitos, diarrea y puede llevar a la muerte de los animales que la presentan. And it does require intensive care, including nothing for us, because as soon as we give something orally to these dogs, their pancreas gets stimulated and cause more damage. 
Estos perros deben ser atendidos en urgencia y medicados vía parenteral, porque si los alimentamos o le damos algo por boca, eso hace que el páncreas libere más enzimas y toxinas. So they actually have to be on fluids in order to do well and have to be managed for a long time. Por eso deben estar recibiendo fluidos para poder manejar los síntomas y eso tiene que ser una actividad de bastante tiempo. So I'm actually getting right here to the next uh, disease that my colleague or previous student is studying uh, in your breed, and that is the calcium oxalate alkali in miniature schnauzers. This is a common problem in the breed, and it can cause urinary obstruction uh, because of these calculites that you see here. The crystals look sort of like a uh, square shaped and the calculi are often on the whitish side but they can also turn a little yellow probably more from the urine than anything else. Los cristales se ven como pequeños cuadrados, pero los cálculos se ven más bien circulares y pueden ser amarillos, pero más que nada por ser coloreados por los orinos. So the veterinarian can actually identify the disease based on a urine sediment, which is typically done when one looks at urine analysis. That can be a free catch, doesn't need to be a cysto or a catheterization. And obviously, if a dog gets blocked, it might need emergency surgery or endoscopy removal of the calcaline. There's also an instrument called lithotripsy to blast the rocks to remove them then through the urinary tract. Los animales que presentan una obstrucción, como los cálculos, pueden estar cirugía de urgencia, necesitar que le retiren los cálculos a través de endoscopía o a través de un aparato que produce la destrucción de los cálculos para que sean eliminados posteriormente por el hígado. And this is inherited in the breed. The precise mechanism is not yet known. And it is this diet to some degree manageable, but the animals are always predisposed to these calculi when they have that. And while I mention here again the miniature schnauzer, it does happen in other breeds and it also happens in cats, so you're not alone, but it is a bigger issue in your breed than other breeds. Another disease that is actually not common in the breed uh, is mucopolysaccharidosis type 6 in the miniature schnauzer. I mentioned this because we do have work on this particular disease predominantly actually to assist human medicine in models for the children to make them uh, understand the disease and hopefully develop some gene therapy for it and other therapies. Uh, for human medicine because children have that disease. And we are hoping in this particular disease actually to develop some gene therapy so when babies are born that they could receive the treatment right away to get a much better outcome than what this disease otherwise would do. In fact, in this disease, they have very, very serious skeletal abnormalities, which you can slightly appreciate when you're looking at 
uh, the, the, the radiographs, how they form the back case at the top radiograph versus the bottom one. Also, it doesn't show well on the screen here, but I can assure you here it shows quite well. Estos estos animales presentan una gran deformación en la columna, como se puede ver en las radiografías, versus a una columna normal. They also have head deformities, they have ocular changes, and they also have some neurological signs. So it's a devastating progressive disease at very early stage in life that cannot be missed, but obviously often is just considered a malformation, not necessarily a genetic defect. También se presentan anomalías en el cráneo, en los ojos, y muchas veces es tomada en cuenta como un defecto congénito, como una anomalidad, y no como una enfermedad genética. We have only recognized this disease in the United States. I've not seen it in South America or in Europe or Australia. But if you see a puppy having signs like that, the veterinarian could actually look at the blood smear again, like this one, and I apologize, you can't see it easily, but the white cells that I showed before, these are the white cells that are bluish here. They're called white cells because that's what they're in the blood, look like white. And they have very many, many granules, bluish granules that the veterinarian can easily recognize and thereby suspect the disease. And then we have a DNA test and we have enzyme tests to make a diagnosis. Si tenemos animales que presentan algunos de los síntomas y deformaciones, un veterinario puede fácilmente incluir la enfermedad mediante un extendido de sangre donde se ven los glóbulos blancos con depósitos de granos azules y esto es un indicio de la presencia de la enfermedad. So while we don't see that frequently in the miniature schnauzers, we see this frequently in miniature pinchers. And the miniature pinchers are also seen in Australia, South America, and Europe to have this disease. So this is a very devastating disease. There is no good outcome whatsoever at this stage. And we have studied this uh, because we have studied other forms uh, of it and stumbled on that and also made the diagnosis for that breed. So the next one is myotonia congenita, which is a very classic disease that was widespread in the breed at some point. I'm going to get out of this here quickly, and I'm hoping that I can turn this on. Um, that are trying to get out of a cage, and you see they are very hesitant to do so. They're really hesitant because they know as soon as they, they take that little jump down from the higher level to the floor, their muscle is gonna stiffen up, and they're gonna be stiff for a little while, and then it weakens again and they can move around a little bit more. And once they have done this, they can get moving around that they do okay. You see, that these are all affected ones. So we recognize this uh, first actually in the area of Philadelphia. And uh, one of the prominent handlers actually showed, uh, allowed me to study this uh, in more detail. 
And so we actually were able to uh, work on this disease quite a bit and recognize this disease to be a problem. I'm just trying to see where is that symbol for me to make it big. F5. F5. Okay. Esta enfermedad entonces por medio de Cristo está en Filadelfia y tuvieron la posibilidad de trabajar sobre esta enfermedad bastante. So these dogs look a little bit like Schwarzenegger, the Terminator. Estos perros parecen parecen a Schwarzenegger en Terminator. So they have very big muscles on the shoulder. As you can see, they look like double muscle. And they also have very big hind leg muscles. So they have a muscle hypertrophy. And they do some bunny hopping. And when you're pressing into the muscle in the shoulder or on the back leg, it actually makes a dimpling, an indentation from the contraction. What's the problem is that there is a chloride channel that doesn't function properly and so as soon as the muscle gets a little excitement, it really strongly excites and that gives you this kind of noise uh, here with an electron uh, myelography. Uh, we call that a dive bomber noise or a motorcycle noise. So the muscle gets always stimulated and that's going to cause this muscle hypertrophy and doesn't let uh, relaxation happen and so they stiffen up until they relax after a few seconds to minutes. El músculo se encuentra entonces hiperestimulado, generando una contracción continua y no permitiendo la relajación del músculo. Los músculos están hipersensibles. Another thing that you will recognize is these dogs that are affected in this particular breed, not in other breeds that have this disease, like the Chow Chow, is a peak like jaw. Eh, es una miniatura que padece esta enfermedad de miotonía. So they have a very narrow jaw, a little bit like a peak, like a bird. And the teeth are together and we assume it's actually the muscle contraction that pulls the jaw sides together to make this narrow jaw. Tienen entonces una mandíbula muy angosta en forma de pico y creemos que esto se debe a la fuerza que hacen los músculos arrimando las dos ramas de la mandíbula entre ellas. Now this is the first genetic disease that we identified in the breed at the molecular level. And you can see here, and I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow, but you can see here the basis and there is a change from this sequence only in this particular C here, which causes then a missense and the disease. So you can see a single letter in the DNA instead of an ACG, an ATG causes this severe disease. Doesn't take a lot. So actually, this is a disease that we have studied in many thousands of miniature schnauzers. I include here up to 2,000 because at that time we really have already very good control over the disease and since we screen, but it isn't anymore as um, important today as it was in the 19th uh, in the 20th century.
Entonces, esta enfermedad hemos estudiado más que en los mil casos, al momento de este estudio, ya la enfermedad estaba bajo control y ya no hacía falta seguir detectando tanto, seguimos monitoreándola, pero ya no tiene tanta importancia como tenía el siglo pasado. When I started off, it was my patient in the clinic that comes in with the disease and we didn't know what it was, but recognized that it was my Tony congenita. And then we worked on a molecular defect and identified that and offered that DNA test to the breed. Entonces, esta enfermedad la vi por primera vez en la clínica con un paciente, sabíamos que era mi autonía congénita y a raíz de él empezamos a tratar primero el defecto molecular y luego poder identificar el gen para después traspasarlo a la raza. In the early period, it was 18% of all the dogs that were carriers. En principio, cuando empezamos a investigar, el 18% de los perros eran portadores de la enfermedad. So it was one in five dogs that was a carrier, but obviously that group of animals that was tested was a little biased because the people had some knowledge which dogs needed to be tested. I'm, I'm sorry, the pedigree doesn't show too well here, but you can see, sorry, uh, This is a pedigree which has dogs that are affected in black and then we screened the general population and you can see every dog that has actually a dog here is a carrier. In this animal genealogy, which doesn't see well, we can observe that the dogs that present the disease are the circles or the rectangles that are totally white y aquellos que son carriers son aquellos que tienen un puntito negro adentro. Now you can't see the line that all go up in this direction to this particular dog here. Todos estos perros van en dirección al perro que está marcado con la flecha roja. And so when we look at the pedigree from this disease, uh, from these diseased and carrier animals, we recognize one single dog to be the original dog that was a carrier. And Mrs. Hooper in Pennsylvania was allowing me to tell everybody in the world and she told everybody in the world as well that this was shooting sparks. Shooting sparks. So, this dog obviously did not only shoot sparks, but he shoots sperms, and unfortunately half of his sperms were having the genetic defect that caused the myotonia if bred to another dog that was a carrier. So, this is actually a disease where we recognize the first original dogs not only by pedigree but also by testing. So, we were able to test this dog, and it was the first carrier, and every single dog that was a carrier or affected was related to that particular dog. Con este perro no solo pudimos rastrearlo por pedigree, sino por genética y por test, sabiendo que cada perro que estaba afectado o era portador descendía de este perro particular. So after we tested the initial thousand or so dogs, we obviously recognized that the breeders also figured out where it is, and so they were able to focus their effort on that particular line of dogs, which was a big line, because that dog was a beautiful dog, and I actually predict... Uh, yeah. Entonces, los criadores pudieron hacer un trabajo enfocándose particularmente en los perros que tenían a este perro en particular en sus pedigrees, y este perro se encontraba ampliamente excluido de todos los pedigrees porque era un perro muy lindo. 
I actually predict that shooting spark was probably prettier because he was carrying the gene defect for myotonia and had a little bit more muscle, but obviously no disease as a carrier. And that's made the dog popular and his offspring very popular. El predico que este perro probablemente era tan lindo porque era portador del gen y el portar este gen de ser carrier hacía que tuviera una musculatura más llamativa, haciendo que se usara más que todos sus hijos generaron el gen también presentaran esta característica. Do you have four horses here in Argentina? Quarter horses? No, no quarter horses. But you know, in quarter horses, there is a similar muscle disease that actually, when they are diseased or have to trade, they are looking better. And there's also another one in cattle where they have actually double muscling, as they call them, to make more muscle and thereby have probably more meat. So I told you obviously a lot about different diseases and it can be overwhelming overall because there are so many diseases that uh, one would like to know about. And it is difficult. It is difficult for breeders to know all the diseases in the breed and it is even more difficult for veterinarians who have to deal with all the breeds, you know, and there are like 400 breeds of dogs. And we made major progress in regard to DNA testing, so we have very good diagnostics for some, but not everyone knows about it. But DNA testing is actually something that you can do from Argentina and anywhere in the world. So I have been involved with the World Small Animal Veterinary Association and particularly the Hereditary Disease Committee since 2006 or so. And this committee, uh, particularly my group, developed then a database which contains all the DNA tests for dogs and cats where there is a genetic defect. So we developed that uh, somewhere around 2000 and uh, uh, I would say eight or so. It took a long time to really get there. But it is a very useful database where you as breeder, pet owner or veterinarian can go on and see if there is a DNA test available for a particular disease. So you can choose either to go on the WSAVA, the World Small Animal Veterinary Association site, or you can also choose to just uh, go on PenGen, which is my laboratory, PenGen, and go for available tests worldwide. Entonces, 
And then you're going to see this page, which allows you to either search for a certain disease that you know, like myotonia congenita or avian tuberculosis or others, or you could check with the breed and see what breed tests are available, like your miniature schnauzer. Or if you are working with a particular lab, like our lab or Optigen or another lab, you can actually ask for that lab whether they do the testing or not. And I will talk probably tomorrow a little bit more. We don't only have single DNA tests available, but a variety of laboratories are offering panel tests where you can get all the testing done with one cheek swab or two cheek swabs or one blood sample. Probablemente el desarrollo no hace el tema mañana, pero aparte de tener test disponibles genéticos para una sola enfermedad, muchos laboratorios hoy están ofreciendo paneles de test con uno o dos eh, cepillos o isopos de isopado de la boca para realizar el test sobre varias enfermedades. So you can't see it, but actually here we are listing this multi-disease screenings, which are different laboratories and they are different names, such as the Canine Health Check, or Embark, or My Dog DNA, or the Wisdom Panel, or Optimal Selection. These are panel tests that allow you now to do actually of a dog all the DNA tests that are available. So the only tests that are not on there necessarily by everybody is when it is patented or when the disease has not yet been fully described. So maybe tomorrow we will get also access to the internet. We were obviously late today and I apologize again. But we might go on, or you can go on it at home and check it out and see if there is something that you are of interest uh, in it. So you can click on the lab and you can get all the information on how to submit the sample, how much it costs, and how long it takes until we get the results back. So you get all the information, either as a veterinarian, as a breeder, or as actually the owner. So, for the last period, or complete, I'm not yet sure if we have time, avian tuberculosis, because I assume Several of you actually came to my seminar here because of avian tuberculosis, correct? So before I start, I want to acknowledge a few people because this would not have been possible for me to do this study overall and figure out what the cause is and then offer to you a DNA test and do everything else. So there is obviously the American Miniature Schnauzer Club, and at that time, Carol Weinberger was actually the president uh, and uh, leading uh, some of that uh, study. Una de ellas es la presidenta del American Miniature Schnauzer Club, que en ese momento Carl Weinberger. 
There is also then a health committee which was very strong under the leadership of Patty Henderson and also Kurt Garmack, uh, Garmack, uh, who really are heavily involved with the breed and push the health issues quite a bit. También el Club de la Americana de Schnauzer tenía un comité de salud que era liderado por Patty Henderson y Kurt Garmaker, que ellos realmente dieron mucha importancia a los temas de salud que se presentaban en la raza fomentando su estudio. And before they actually got involved, there was the person Evelyn Martin. I don't think has anything to do with Martin um, uh, from uh, here. I don't think he's here, but uh, oh, back there. Yes, okay. It has nothing to do with you, I think, because that's Martin last name. But she was originally doing some of the studies and helped me getting the initial samples. Inicialmente, la primera persona que empezó a realizar estudios al respecto fue Evelyn Martin, que fue quien le dio las primeras muestras al doctor para que empiece su estudio. And there are obviously numerous pet owners and breeders and veterinarians who helped me as well, and in fact, internationally, because this disease, as you obviously know, is not just a USA issue. Y muchos criadores y dueños de mascotas que me ayudaron alrededor del mundo y en Estados Unidos, porque todos sabemos que esta enfermedad no es un problema exclusivamente de Estados Unidos. And there is obviously financial support, and I want to acknowledge the Grey Lady Foundation, which is from a person, uh, Mrs. Grey, who actually had miniature schnauzers who gave us a grant, and then particularly the American Kennel Club, Kennel uh, Health Foundation, supported by the miniature schnauzer club that gave us funding for the study. Y finalmente, la asistencia financiera que fue dada por la Grey Lady Foundation, la señora Grey, que era propietaria de las miniaturas, y la Fundación de Salud Canina de la American Kennel Club, que también dio financiación para los estudios. This was a great effort by the breeders to help me getting these samples and doing the study. Uh, without their help, we would not have been able to do that. Uh, now I also know in Argentina there were several very crucial people that helped in looking at this disease here in Argentina and I believe were very, very instrumental in helping the breed to not get into further disaster with affected dogs. Hay que reconocer a determinadas personas y veterinarios en la Argentina que colaboraron mucho para la obtención de muestras y para evitar que esta enfermedad sea realmente un problema para la vida. So I apologize for the writing. In my computer it's all correct, but this transfer from my Mac onto this computer made many of the words a little jiggle. But Dr. Ricardo Coco who unfortunately could not be here today, but I asked him uh, how he is doing. He's actually doing fine at home. Uh, he obviously has a health issue, uh, but he sent me a picture, so at least I could share the picture with you as he is not here. Bueno, obviamente está el doctor Ricardo Coco, que lamentablemente no pudo asistir a la conferencia por problemas de salud. Se encuentra en su casa, está bien, pero le pedí que me traiga una foto para poder hacerlo I understand the president, the Schnauzer uh, Club president, had uh, Mr. Marty had a lot to do in getting this accomplished as well, and particularly Dr. Graciela, who uh, gave a very kind introduction, who was very, very helpful in getting many of the samples collected as well. And Mr. Martin, as well as his sister Natalia, I think were very helpful starting to think that this is a big issue and getting testing early on done on their dogs, I think encouraged many others as well to do so. Que tomaron conciencia que esta enfermedad era algo grave y empezaron a testear 
tempranamente sus ejemplares, siendo también inspiración para otros criadores para testear. And then we have Dr. Uh, Doctora uh, Rocio, Rocio uh, who I want to thank very much for excellent translation. I sh I'm sure she gave every bit of translation in a perfect way, very fast, very nice. Uh, and she is obviously helping with the whole process here as well. And we have connections. There are people like Carol, Barbara, Errol, and Patricia who have been involved in this communication as well internationally and made this much more a relevant issue and a issue that is being taken care of here in Argentina. And if I forgot anyone, I apologize because I do not know all the people because Dr. Ricardo Coco, he mostly managed the connection with me and he used many times Google Translate that we tried and I did the same thing to see that we can understand each other. Now I'm not going to get into the people that worked with me except uh, Keichiro Mizukami who is a Japanese veterinarian and researcher he came to my laboratory and worked for two years solid on this disease and identified much of the problems. But there are many others who have also helped me, including others from other universities. No voy a entrar en detalle ni a nombrar a mi equipo, pero sí voy a nombrar al doctor Tejido Mizukami, que vino de Japón y trabajó conmigo, ayudando a so when we are talking about avian tuberculosis, this is actually a disease that people and animals, mammalian animals, don't usually get. They are resistant, naturally resistant. And that is good because the organism, the microorganism, the microbacterium is actually ubiquitous, which means everywhere. It is seen in people, and the people are the ones that are immune suppressed, particularly people with HIV infection as well as the very young babies, as uh, well as the elderly people, or maybe some people on some cancer drugs or other types of uh, medications that might get avian tuberculosis. O bien cualquier persona que se encuentre medicada con alguna medicación que produjo una inmunosupresión severa. That avian tuberculosis can happen. And not surprising to the audience here, most of the reports are actually from miniature schnauzers. Hay muy pocos reportes sobre la tuberculosis había en los perros, es realmente raro, pero la mayoría de los casos que se presentan son justamente en schnauzer miniatura. And because this is known for over 25 years to have uh, been in the literature, but probably we know since 1986 that there is some of that around, uh, this suggested that there is a genetic predisposition, which really made me interested uh, because I like to study genetic diseases. <laughs> And again, miniature schnauzers are not the only one. 
there are actually some facets that are also genetically predisposed, and that was reported in 1990, and I have seen a few of the facets, including one last, uh, last spring, just a few months ago. Esta enfermedad también se presenta en otras razas como el Basset Hound, teniendo el primer registro de esta enfermedad en la raza Basset en el año 1990 y el invierno en la primavera pasada. The affected dogs are always young adults to middle-aged dogs, maybe as old as maybe seven years of age, but all of them are more in the two, three years of age uh, range. Los animales afectados son animales que se encuentran en una edad del adulto joven o adultos entre los dos y tres años de edad. And unfortunately, some of these dogs are also misdiagnosed as having, for instance, lymphosarcoma or lymphoma, histiocytic sarcoma, maybe leishmaniasis, and possibly fungal diseases. Muchos de estos animales están mal diagnosticados con, por ejemplo, linfoma, sarcoma histiocítico, enfermedades histéricas, leishmaniasis. That's fine, that's fine. And uh, so, what I want to point out is you need to make sure when you have a diseased animal to make a definitive diagnosis, which can be made quite easily if one thinks of avian tuberculosis. So the clinical signs may not be so specific because they show lethargy, inappetence, weakness, some nasal discharge, conjunctivitis, diarrhea, you know, all the kinds of signs that may not be very specific and you just don't know what that is. Los síntomas de la enfermedad son bastante inespecíficos y son letargia, inapetencia, debilidad, descarga nasal, conjuntivitis, diarrea, more specific for avian tuberculosis is when they have lymph node swellings, which you can see the lymph nodes in the neck area here, in front of the scapula, uh, underneath the uh, limb, as well as in the inguinal area. Es subjetivo de tuberculosis aviar un agrandamiento de inflamación de los linfonódulos, como vamos a ver en el cuello, supraescapular, delante de escápula, el nódulo, axila, el poplíteo que se atrasa en la pierna. And the popliteal as well, if you've said it. But I mean, I'm just saying, if you look at your dog, even as an owner, you might actually feel a little um, uh, nuts or uh, maybe like a little plum or so that can be quite big. And some of them also have skin disease. Entonces, como propietarios podemos identificar estos nódulos linfáticos agrandados mediante la observación de la palpación y también presenta síntomas de piel. And when we do look inside the dog by ultrasound or radiograph, we will see that they frequently have a big spleen and a big liver, and it may be very lumpy, bumpy. But, but even if you have these signs, that could still be cancer and another infection. And so you really need to go and pursue. And that can be done by aspirating one of these nodes or by taking a biopsy or even a lymph node to get a diagnosis. This is a disease that the university at Buenos Aires has been diagnosing many times. In fact, they have a report of many pathological descriptions, and I know they have over 20 cases seen at the one university with this problem in your brain. 
que la Universidad de Buenos Aires esta enfermedad ha sido descrita en más de 20 pacientes, todos ellos de Massage Nausea. You do need to be careful as a veterinarian because this is a zoonotic disease and also as a breeder and owner because if you do get in contact with the nasal discharge, with the diarrhea, the vomiting and obviously the necropsy, the autopsy, you're going to be exposing your uh, environment and yourself and everyone else to these bacteria in high concentration and if anyone is immune suppressed that might be a predisposing factor. So this is not a bacterium that the veterinarians, the regular veterinarians, wants to grow in their laboratory, uh, in their clinic. This has to be shipped to a special laboratory because there are too many risks involved. But if they do that, they can do it very nicely and get you a specific diagnosis. Estos, estos animales con esta bacteria, con sospechas de diagnóstico, deben ser a laboratorios especializados por el riesgo que implica trabajar con estos pacientes. So when you're looking, for instance, here, the spleen here has very little bumpy things on there. That's obviously very pathological. That's the kind of what you might have heard for tuberculosis in humans, where it is in the lung, in other uh, uh, organ systems, a very granulomatous, um, you know, nodular type of disease. So every miniature schnauzer who has this genetic predisposition and is of the age that it could have it, always has avian tuberculosis, but may also have some other infections. One of the unusual findings is that they may have candidiasis, and candidiasis is not typically seen in our dogs, but it is actually what is seen in humans with this genetic defect. It's very fortunate that many breeders have already thought of this being a genetic trait and they produced partially a pedigree where the affected dogs here are shown in red and the carriers in yellow. Every dog that has this is a miniature schnauzer. There is no standard schnauzer and there is no giant schnauzer that has had avian tuberculosis. And every dog that we have identified having disease or we have identified with the DNA test that I talk later about is related to one dog from 1986. So what we did is we started off about 10 years ago to collect and select samples from miniature schnauzers uh, that had the disease. We did a genome-wide association study, and I'll show probably tomorrow a little bit more details about that. And we did whole genome sequencing, which is an amazing tool that was billions of dollars a few years back for a human to be sequenced, and now is affordable that we could do it with the money that we got.
Entonces, lo que hicimos fue un genoma y también hicimos una secuencia genómica completa, que es un estudio que en su momento era sumamente costoso para los seres humanos, pero que en este momento lo podemos hacer. So we had some samples from affected dogs and we had some controls. Also the controls are difficult because we don't know everything about the controls. And we had also other dogs from other breeds that we were able to compare the genome with. But with this kind of comparison of normal, which we also call, call controls, and the affected, we were able to find a gene region or a genomic region which had a few genes and then see if one of the genes had actually a mutation, just like I showed you for the uh, myotonia congenita. We are still working on immune uh, dysfunction because that is not yet completely understood based on what we know from the molecular genetics. So we actually used uh, cases from 1991 on. We used 35 documented cases by clearly showing that they had disease. And we had other 100 cases that were suspected to have the problem as well. And we had also 12 cases from necropsies from uh, Argentina. And you see here on the right hand side, it doesn't show well, uh, the pedigree, which is here a little better, that shows that all the dogs go back to uh, this particular dog or its mother. That's where it is. So the GWAS actually showed us this uh, signal here, which is not very nicely shown but uh, on the picture here. But uh, I think you can see that peak here is the very significant finding for us to actually identify that there was a mutation in the affected dog in that particular area. And with lots of additional work that I'm not going to get into the details because it's very technical, we came to one gene. Controls, eight MAC dogs. And what we found is one gene that is known as CART9, CARD9, which has a very long name, doesn't matter what the name is, but it is very important in the signaling pathway for immune systems. And it is a three-base deletion which really cuts out one of the amino acids which is highly conserved. It is three-base deletion which cuts out one amino acid uh, which is highly conserved and very important for that protein. So, with that information, I'm going to skip here because we want to leave some time for uh, discussion as well. Uh, I just want to go on. Uh, I'm going to skip these things because we have these later on. Um, but what I want to say is, 
what we did identify is that mutation is perfectly correlated, associated with the disease. Every single dog that has avian tuberculosis in the miniature schnauzer breed is homozygous for that mutation. There's not a single exception. Control dogs were all free of the disease as they were unrelated to that population. Every dog that is homozygous is diseased unless it is a puppy or young dog. We screened over 2,000 miniature schnauzers in North America and Europe, and 8% are carriers. So, one in 12 miniature schnauzers is a carrier based on our study, but it is biased because people know which dogs to screen for. You might have seen in the, in the chat room on the website that some people were questioning the test but we were able to prove that that was mispaternity rather than a bad test. Now in Argentina, we actually screened around 300 dogs and at the moment the percentage is 12%. It was more like 15 and more percent originally, but because now people have obviously figured out what the problem is, it is going to reduce. And hopefully we will see no more of the affected dogs, uh, while the carriers can certainly be used. Entonces, inicialmente era un 15%, pero como se ha tomado conciencia y se empezó a trabajar, empezó este número a disminuir y esperamos no ver más perros afectados y con los carriers uno puede hacer un trabajo inteligente. The testing is also quite robust that you can see the affected, the carriers and normals based on our DNA analysis, which is real-time PCR. This is the testing uh, that we are showing. These are actually the results of each single dog. These are the affected in blue, in green the carriers with one, two, one normal and one abnormal gene, and then the normals with two normal genes. So I think this one is uh, not very good and I'm going to leave these out and maybe we'll talk about these tomorrow in more detail. So the breeding recommendations, just as the last slide, will be that you should only breed miniature schnauzers if they have been DNA tested. Now, once you have established that they are normal and you are sure of paternity or maternity in some cases, you can call them clear by uh, ancestry. What is a big mistake is if you are eliminating the carriers from your breeding. That is a mistake. 
DNA testing does not determine if you can breed or not, but with whom. Este genético no te dice si podés criar o no, sino con quién tenés que criar. So, it's like marriage counseling with whom you want a partner. Es como un consejero matrimonial, es con quién querés casarte. You definitely want to breed clear to clear if you have both partners as clear, but you can very well breed clear to carrier. On the other hand, you should never, never breed a carrier to a carrier or even an affected to a carrier. The carriers with good character, with good looks, with good temperament, with everything that you want for the breed, you should continue breeding as long as you test every offspring and use those that you want for future breeding, but you will never produce an effect if you do testing of both parents. Podemos crear comportadores que nos gusten y que presenten todas las características deseables en la raza. Siempre que los criemos con libres, no vamos a producir nunca un cachorro enfermo. Y criando con estos perros portadores, debemos siempre testear a las crías. As I described to you in the beginning, there are quite a few hereditary diseases in the breed, like in every other breed. And if you're selecting against one disease, you're probably going to propagate another problem. And that has been shown in other breeds as well. Como todas las razas, los esnaos en miniatura presentan varias enfermedades genéticas. Y si criamos en base a eliminar una enfermedad genética en particular, lo que estamos haciendo es propagar o propiciar la aparición de otras enfermedades genéticas. So you want to be informed by the DNA test and use that information to select the best dogs for your breeding. Entonces, debemos tener información a través de los test genéticos para poder elegir los mejores perros para nuestra crianza. So, I think we have 10 minutes left uh, that we can discuss before the 9 o'clock uh, end of the show. I hope I gave you a quick uh, tour through the hereditary problems in the breed. I realized very much that I ignored the high quality of that breed. The popularity is obviously clear in Argentina of the breed. And certainly we wish to continue to have the breed as healthy as possible and uh, the best dogs, the best dogs in a pet home for the breeder in the show ring and anywhere else. And I know the dogs did very well in the show ring. Congratulations. Quiero decir que la raza se hace un excelente trabajo. Han demostrado una gran calidad en los rings de belleza. Y espero haber aclarado un poco sobre las enfermedades genéticas de la raza y tener en cuenta que podemos trabajar inteligentemente con estas enfermedades y con nuestros perros. Y les agradezco por la atención y el excelente ah. trabajo. I want to compliment you on taking on this disease so seriously and screening all your dogs in Argentina so well. You are a leader and I will use you as an example in many other countries where I talk about the disease more from the immune deficiency, not as just the breed. And hope everyone else will do as well as you have done. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to present the work that we did with you. Prometo entonces seguir trabajando seriamente en el, en el screening o diagnóstico de los perros en Argentina en el test genético. Son precursores por la cantidad de test y bueno, los voy a usar como ejemplo para charlas en otros países. Y espero que podamos seguir trabajando de esta manera. Thank you.
es eh, más que nada un comentario, una pregunta. Eh, mi hijo tiene 16 años, fue diagnosticado con un yun portasistémico intrauterino a los 40, 50 días de vida aproximadamente. Justamente hoy estuvimos en el hospital Garraham eh, rehaciendo chequeos, eh, pero bueno, el doctor aclaró que no se ve en, en chicos, sino en gente adulta con cirrosis o con producto de tomar mucho alcohol. Eh, en Argentina hay 40 casos de chicos, eh, siendo el segundo país eh, con más eh, casos y siendo Francia con 140. Eh, el país que más casos de, de este tipo tiene nada, era una aclaración o un comentario eh, y muchas cosas de las que dijo sobre los perros se traslada también al, al humano en este caso, en un caso particular eso con respecto a esta forma okay. so... It may be that in your country this is a problem, but at my children's hospital in the University of Pennsylvania and many other places throughout the world, shunts in babies is extraordinarily rare, if at all seen. So maybe it is the, I need to look into that, if that's reported. It may be something completely different. I don't know about this, but I will look into it. Thank you. Quizás aquí en Argentina el hay cierta prevalencia de ayuno corto sistémico en niños, pero en el hospital de Pensilvania, de Pensilvania y en otros hospitales de niños realmente es muy poco frecuente, por no decir que no se han registrado casos. Él dice que no tiene información al respecto, pero que va a fijarse o investigar si es exactamente la misma patología o es otra diferente. Por lo que explicó, es, es muy similar. Por no decir la misma, porque no soy especialista en el tema. Con respecto, ahora sí es una pregunta a la miotonía congénita, si, si están testeando, si a través del club podemos hacer test y si en, el, en esta ocasión, como va a llevar muestras para MAC, también se puede llevar para miotonía. So absolutely, if you have a disease that you are testing for DNA with cheek swabs or blood samples, that sample could be used for also another disease as long as it's in the same lab. If it's different laboratories, there might be some problems in getting the samples from one place to the other. There's also concerns about identities, etc. that may not work easily. Yes, and we test pretty much, uh, a lot of them uh, have been tested in the United States, actually. Dice que sí, que testean, y que, pero después explicó que si, si el test se tiene que realizar siempre en el mismo laboratorio, por si no puede haber confusiones y demás. That's also true when you're using a panel test. So the panel tests that are available by some companies, the big companies like Mars and so on, they will do multiple mutation tests with one sample. Dice que los laboratorios que hacen paneles pueden hacer eh, test para, para varias mutaciones con un solo con una sola muestra. This kind of technology has become available only in the last few years and is restricted by big instrumentations to a few laboratories. Esto hace poco que se desarrolló y está solo limitado para laboratorios que tienen que pueden hacer una instrumentación de algo tan grande. Hola, eh, bueno, nosotros somos criadores de bolleros de Berna y tenemos eh, dos enfermedades que nos preocupan, que es la histiosiquiosis y la melopatía degenerativa. Queríamos saber eh, qué opinión o en qué instancias nos podrías brindar algún tipo de resumen de información. Y también si ustedes realizan en el laboratorio el test genético. Okay. 
So, uh, right. So, Bernese Mountain Dogs are a Swiss breed, and they are perfect. They don't have disease. No tienen enfermedades. No. Unfortunately, Bernese Mountain Dogs, as any other breeds, they do have genetic diseases, that you are referring to two major problems in the breed. Malignant histiocytosis, there is a marker that has been identified, but it is yet to be commercially completely established that that marker is definitive to tell which dogs will get that cancer, which is very similar to lymphosarcoma, but it's a different type. El, para histiocitosis maligna ya se pudo detectar un marcador genético, pero todavía no está totalmente eh, especificado, pero este, porque para poder determinar si los animales que lo tienen realmente van a desarrollar este tipo de cáncer que es similar al linfosarcoma. So there is hope to define this further and it is a really major problem causing actually in part similar signs like avian tuberculosis but obviously it's not infection but it is a cancer that causes severe disease and death. Bueno, es una gran preocupación al igual porque produce síntomas similares a lo que es la tuberculosis aviar aunque no es una enfermedad infecciosa sino una enfermedad tumoral grave. Now the problem is the degenerative myelopathy is that there is a special mutation in that breed which is in the gene called SOD1, which has been associated with the disease in the Burmese mountain dogs only. Para la mielopatía de progresiva degenerativa, se reconoció un gen, el SOD1, que está asociado directamente a esta, a esta mielopatía. And that mutation is not definitive to cause disease. And there are dogs that are older that don't have the disease, and some dogs that have not the mutation still may have actually the disease. Pero la presencia de esta mutación en este gen, en el SOD1, no es definitiva para decir que el animal va a tener la enfermedad. Hay animales que presentan la mutación y no presentan la enfermedad, y se han descrito casos de animales que presentan la enfermedad sin tener necesariamente la mutación. And the other breeds is not a good example for DNA testing. It is being used, but it is an imperfect test that does not completely predict who gets it and who doesn't. Y entonces la mielopatía degenerativa progresiva es un mal ejemplo para una enfermedad que se puede testear genéticamente. Realmente no predice correctamente quién se va a enfermar y quién no. So you still need to get a little bit more information from the people who study that disease. We don't study that disease. We have not worked on that disease. But it's my understanding from what's published, there are concerns with the test because not every dog that is having a mutation has early onset of the disease, meaning middle age. Some are 12 years old or so, which is very old for a and there are some dogs that have it without that mutation because there is another mutation and possibly another one. Entonces, es conveniente que te comunique con el laboratorio la gente que está desarrollando este test. Ellos no trabajan con él, pero por la bibliografía que hay disponible, es un test muy inexacto porque hay perros que no, pre que no presentan la enfermedad teniendo la mutación o que la presentan a una edad muy muy entrado en años, a partir de los 12 años de edad, que es una edad muy avanzada para un pollero de Berna, y hay animales que están presentando la mielopatía sin tener la mutación genética. Por ende, no es un test que pueda predecir exactamente eh, la enfermedad. So it is a little bit similar to what I was talking about, progressive retinal atrophy in a miniature schnauzer. There is an A type, there is a B type, and there are more. And all of them seem to affect the breed, but the B is the most common one. Es más o menos lo que pasa con el PRA en la raza Schnauzer miniatura. Hay un tipo A, 
un tipo B y hay muchísimos más tipos, pero el test genético no puede predecir exactamente quiénes van a presentar la enfermedad. ¿Pero So I know a couple of diseases in transgenesis and I'll, uh, congenital hypothyroidism is one of them and, and uh, probability deficiency and I will mention that tomorrow. But because of time, I wonder if we should do the discussion tomorrow further. So who is not going to be here tomorrow and needs to answer questions? Respecto de PRA, él no tiene información respecto de eh, los ayunados gigantes, pero por la hora que es, eh, pregunta quiénes no van a estar mañana, y seguir con estas preguntas mañana, los que no vayan a estar, que pregunten ahora, quiénes no van a estar mañana en la conferencia. Right, so I can't specifically answer your questions for Argentina because you may have regulatory requirements that are different from our place. But I can tell you the U.S. is fairly strict on infectious disease. We are allowed to ship samples in double wrapping, which means Ziploc bags, one and a second, and an external uh, packaging and ship it that way to a specific laboratory that can handle it. Entonces, no sabe qué reglamentaciones hay en la Argentina respecto al envío de estas muestras, pero sí que en Estados Unidos está requerido que se envuelvan, que tengan dos envoltorios, en caso de ellos hacen dos bolsas ciclo, una donde está la muestra, una más, un embalaje especial que solo puede ser remitido al laboratorio donde pueden manejar You could actually originally start off with just an aspirate on a smear and ask them to specially stain it or regularly stain it and they likely can make the diagnosis of a suspect avian tuberculosis and then you can do the more diagnostics. Y eso se puede mandar al laboratorio y pedir que sea una atención especial y con eso te obtener un buen diagnóstico. Now, if the animal is diseased, you don't necessarily have to send me samples, but I would actually like to get that sample at some point. Si tenés un animal enfermo, dice que no es obligatorio mandarle las muestras, pero le gustaría mucho el caso de tener algún animal diagnosticado enfermo que le lleguen muestras de estos animales a él. Because we only have two years of experience, and so there might still be something to be learned about it. Okay. Who is another person who is not going to be here tomorrow? I will be on time here. I'll walk from my hotel. Mañana va a estar en horario, si es necesario va a caminar desde su 